Yesterday we talked about the regulating or controlling of Paticca Samupada. When we can do so, then there arises something which we call Paticca, Paticca Nirota, which is the, the quenching or seizing of Paticca Samupada. The, the word Paticca Nirota doesn't actually appear in the Pali scriptures directly, but it's implied every time the Buddha discussed the subject because as we talked already about dependent origination, Paticca Samupada, how things Samupada arise, then he always would talk in the reverse order how dependent on this, this quenches, dependent on this, this quenches. So it's dependent, quenching, 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 which is the meaning of Paticca Nirota. If one sees the matter for oneself, one realizes that this, these words are an appropriate way to, to discuss what we're talking about now. So in the the formula for this is avicca niroto, sankara niroto, vinyana niroto, or ignorance quenches, sankara concocting quenches, consciousness quenches, mind body quenches, 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 quenches. And so we call it paticca nirota. Nirota is a quenching or going out. Before we go on, we'd like to talk about a part of this that is very difficult to understand, that is very profound, that is hard to see. At one time, the Venerable Ananda, who was the cousin of the Buddha, and then for much of the Buddha's life was also his personal attendant, and so they were quite close. The Venerable Ananda went to the Buddha and said that Paticca Samupada had occurred to him, that is to Venerable Ananda as Yawa Kampiro, which is merely merely profound. It's, he, it's like saying, it's, oh, it's, it's pretty profound. <laughs> One is able to say that it's profound, meaning it's not so profound. And the Buddha said, don't say that, don't say that. This, this is very, very profound. And the, the exact words he spoke, although the Buddha's language was always quite polite, the, boot, the words were quite, he was quite shocked that Ananda would say that it's, it's rather profound or pretty profound. And the Buddha said, don't be crazy, don't say something so stupid like that. It's incredibly profound, it's so profound that very few people are able to fully understand it. So we, we need to understand that this is the most profound thing there is in, in life, that there is in the universe, in this infinite time and space, there is nothing more profound and more difficult to understand than Paticca Samupada. We should appreciate it in this way and not take, take it lightly. For example, words such as mind-body quenches, mind-body extinguishes. These words are very difficult to understand because where mind-body extinguishes, mind and body go out, but the person doesn't die. This is very difficult to understand, so please prepare yourself to listen carefully. so you can understand this very difficult subject. 
This is the opposite or the reverse of Paticca Samupada. Paticca Samupada goes this way and Paticca Nirota goes the opposite direction. The formula for this runs Avicca Yata Viraka Nirota because because Avicca ignorance extinguishes without any remainder Sankara Niroto concocting the power of concocting Sankara extinguishes when when ignorance extinguishes then the power that will concoct or condition things like this or like that 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 also extinguishes and then when the sankara concocting extinguishes the vijnana the consciousness which is concocted by that ignorance that consciousness also extinguishes this is very difficult to understand vijnana in this sense in this instance is concocted by ignorance in order to for in order for there to be other kinds of concocting one kind is body concocting another is voice vocal speech concocting and the third is mind concocting meaning concocting actions of body speech and mind this is vijnana is cooked up by ignorance for these for these things but now because this power of sankhara extinguishes then this kind of consciousness this type of consciousness extinguishes when the consciousness that comes from ignorance extinguishes then the nama rupa must extinguish when this when the vijnana consciousness from ignorance extinguishes then mind body extinguishes the person doesn't <laughs> die the person hasn't died even though mind body has when the mind body that is concocted by ignorance extinguishes then the the sense bases the sense media of eyes ears nose tongue body and mind which have been concocted by that ignorant mind body these also extinguish this ignorant kind of sense media extinguishes but that person hasn't become blind hasn't become deaf their their nose they can still smell taste and experience touch sensations and the mind sense also functions completely normally naturally let us interject in an, a very very crucial point that if we don't understand will will confuse the whole issue that is the word nirota or extinguishing sometimes translated cessation or quenching this word extinguishing doesn't mean that something is completely obliterated what it means is that whatever is extinguished ceases to perform its function it stops doing its function this is the meaning of nirota when something performs its function we say it's born it arises this is the word samupada it it comes into function it arises so the eyes when they if the eyes ears nose tongue and etc nirota that means they're not i stops performing its function ear stops performing its function the eyes 
arise and cease, arise and cease, arise and cease, like this constantly, the same with all the rest of the senses and the rest of our, our human experience. So when the eye w does its job, its function, we say it, it arises. When it stops doing that, we say it extinguishes. And so the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind sense are arising, seizing, arising, seizing, arising, seizing, over and over again. But still the, the physical eye and nervous system associated with the eye are, are always there. But in Dhamma language, the words arise and cease, arise and extinguish, are just have have the meaning of coming into function and then ceasing to function. These this way of speaking can be applied even to the word life. When life is not in function, when life is not performing its function, we can say that life ceases, life is extinguished. Then when life does its function, we say life arises, life is born. This is how we speak in Dhamma language. Ordinary people are always speaking in a very materialistic language, purely about physical things. But Dhamma language we're speaking about mental or spiritual things. And so life arises, ceases, arises and ceases. Whether or not it functions according to the meaning of the word life or does not function. And so when these sense media that have been concocted by ignorance, when they extinguish, then the contact, the sense contact which is concocted by these ignorant sense media, that also extinguishes. The ignorant sense contact or the sense contact that is concocted by ignorance extinguishes. Hmm. And then in the same way when this ignorant contact extinguishes, then the, the ignorant feelings that had been conditioned by ignorant contact, those ignorant feelings extinguish. And when the ignorant feelings have extinguished, then ignorant desire or tanha, craving, extinguishes. So in, in the same way, all these things that have been conditioned by ignorance, the ignorant contact ceases, the ignorant feeling ceases, the ignorant desire, the craving ceases, attachment ceases, ignorant grasping and clinging ceases, and so on, all the way until dukkha ceases. All these things which have arisen under the power of ignorance, they all cease in one by one. Ignorance ceases because wicca, correct knowing, comes in. When correct knowing comes in, not knowing is extinguished. But teacha samupada, the dependent arising, is governed by avicca. The Baticha nirota, the dependent seizing, is governed by vicha, mm -hmm. correct knowing. When, when ignorance is the commander in chief of life, it, we have Baticha samupada. When life is under the control of the commander-in-chief of Wicca, knowing and understanding, we call it Paticca Nirota. So please compare the two carefully. We've got Paticca Samupada, dependent arising, dependent origination, and Paticca Nirota, dependent extinguishing, dependent quenching. And then it's very important that we, we experience for ourselves. we observe carefully whether or not our life is commanded 
by Wicha or Awicha? What is our commander in chief? Ignorance or knowledge? Now, ordinarily, naturally, life is dominated by Awicha. Life is governed by this, this not knowing of Avicha. Whenever this is because generally there is a lack of knowledge. In most cases there isn't the, the vicha that knows correctly according to reality. So whenever this vicha is missing, then, then avicha comes in and takes over. And so it's said that avicha is general all over the universe. Ignorance, not knowing correctly, is all over the place. And as soon as it has an opportunity, it, it drops in and takes over. If vicha is there, avicha can't come in and take over. But whenever vicha is missing, whenever there's a lack of correct understanding, then boom, avicha comes in. And so it's said that avicha is all over the place, ready to take over when it, as soon as it gets an opportunity. In the same that way that as soon as light goes away, darkness comes in. Take away light and you immediately, and then take away light and darkness immediately appears. You can understand it in this way. So as we spoke about yesterday, in the controlling, the commanding of Paticca Samupada, if vicha comes in, then contact is not stupid, feeling isn't stupid, there's no stupid tanha, there's no upadana, no existence, no birth, and no dukkha. Through vicha being in charge, all these stupid conditions no longer exist. And this is how vicha governs paticca samupada and doesn't let it happen. And so we can see that we need to have vicha or panya, intuitive wisdom, which is one of the synonyms for vicha. We need to have vicha or wisdom come in and so we we have anapanasati as a way to develop the necessary intuitive wisdom so that sati mindfulness can bring in that wisdom just at the moment right at the moment of contact if through anapanasati mindfulness is sufficiently developed so that it's fast enough, sensitive enough, and wisdom is complete enough, strong enough, then they can be used right there at that moment of contact. And then contact is governed by vicha, and then the whole, whatever results from that contact is also governed by vicha, and then no dukkha occurs. When we speak theoretically, we begin with saying vicha comes in and extinguishes avicha, and then with the extinction of that avicha, sankhara extinguishes, and then ignorant consciousness extinguishes, and then ignorant mind body extinguishes and so on and so on this is the theoretical way of speaking it goes it's very very complete but when it comes to practical a practical way of viewing this how to put it into practice in daily life it's enough to start with contact if mindfulness brings panya intuitive wisdom there then it's not if it brings it, this wisdom, this knowing, 
this correct understanding to the contact, then it isn't a ignorant contact. It's not the contact of of ignorance. And then it's instead it's governed by wisdom. And then whatever comes out of that is not a problem. So in terms of in practical terms, it's enough to have mindfulness deliver wisdom right at the moment of of contact. So we have two words which express the heart of the matter. One is avicca sampatsa and the other is vicca sampatsa to make contact with ignorance and to make contact with with correct knowledge. The two kinds of sense contact, one under the power of ignorance, not knowing correctly, and the other under the power of vicca, knowing correctly. If it's the latter kind, the vicca sampatsa, then the whole thing is under the control of wisdom. And then all this, the ignorant factors are extinguished, extinguished, extinguished. And so no dukkha can arise. We say, and dukkha then, this is extinguished. So we call it paticca nirota, dependent, extinguishing, dependent, cessation. So please understand the the difference between avicca sampatsa and vicca sampatsa. And so this is the the thing that's so difficult to understand, the incredibly profound matter of how are we going to bring in vicca so that ignorance ceases and then that power of concocting ceases and then consciousness ceases and then mind-body ceases so that all of these are extinguished without having to die. Here's the question, how to extinguish all these things without there being death and without having to live in some some trance-like state or something like that. So how to do that is a very profound matter. The Venerable Ananda said it's just, oh, it's just pretty deep, pretty deep. But the Buddha said, no, 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 it's incredibly profound. It's the most profound thing there is. And so we ought to stick to the Buddha's understanding that this is the most profound thing that we can we can learn. And so then there comes, we must ask ourselves then at this point, what is governing our lives? What is in control of our lives? Not knowing or correct knowing, correct understanding. So when there is ignorance, then there is no, there is no understanding. Just as when there is darkness, there is there is no light. So what we do is we come and we study. We study and we train with. We don't just think about it, we get right in there and, and investigate and train with this Paticca Samupada until we can control it. And when we can control Paticca Samupada, then there is Paticca Nirota, dependent extinguishing. At this point we'd like to emphasize the the scientific characteristics of what we're talking about. That this thing we're discussing is very scientific in the way it must be researched, the way of experimenting with these matters. This is why we say that Buddhist Buddhism has a fundamentally scientific attitude because of this way of researching and experimenting, investigating this, this matter to, to 
come to understand this this important issue of whether life is governed by vicha or avicha. What what is controlling life, vicha or avicha? And then through this, but what's important to see here is that this is a spiritual science. It's not just a physical science as most people understand science to be, physics, chemistry, and so on. But it's a science of the mind, a spiritual science. Since we now live in a world dominated by science, the people ought to be studying this spiritual science because it's, it goes even further it's higher than the ordinary physical sciences. This is something that ought to be given the fullest attention of scientists and people living in this scientific world. So if you look carefully at, at this until you see it for yourself, then you'll, you'll believe us when we say that Buddhism is a science. It's not a philosophy. This is very important because Buddhism, it deals directly with the realities in a scientific way. In Buddhism, there's no dependence on assumptions. There's no dependence on speculation, guessing or in deducing that it must be like this, it must be like that. There's none of that in Buddhism, none of this speculative philosophy. It's just like a surgeon cutting into the, the wound and searching for the, the cause of the wound, dealing right there with the real thing, dealing directly with the problem. There's nothing speculative or hypothetical about this. If you work with this, then you'll see that Buddhism is essentially scientific. It's not just a philosophy. But nowadays, people in this world like philosophy. They, it's fun, they get kicks out of it. People are infatuated with philosophy and become deluded by all this speculative thinking, thinking up all kinds of wonderful ideas. And so philosophy becomes an addiction, just like heroin. And so people go and take even Buddhism and turn it into a philosophy. They just turn it into a bunch of speculative ideas, dreaming up all kinds of things, believing in all kinds of things, and they get very addicted by all this. But it's, it's absolutely worthless to approach Buddhism as a philosophy because it, it'll never stop all the speculation, all the theories, all the philosophy will just go on and on and on forever. There's, there's no end. So we must be very careful not to waste Buddhism <coughs> by just turning it into a, a philosophy. Observe that philosophy never ends. The philosophers never reach a conclusion. They just go on and on forever. It's just like the two rails of a railroad. The two rails go on and on forever and they never meet. This is how philosophy is. But science, science comes to the truth and then ends, stops right there at the truth. It doesn't go on forever. It has an end point. We can, come, we can be successful if, if we approach things scientifically. So please, please take this scientific approach to Buddhism and then take all that philosophy and bury it, get rid of it, because it doesn't do anyone any good. It's, it's crucial to take a scientific view of Buddhism. It's not enough just to bury philosophy. First you should incinerate it really good in a hot fire 
and then take all the ashes and sprinkle them in the ocean. Then we'll be through with it for good. If you remember the Dalama Sutta, according to its its principle, we can never we can never realize the truth through logic. Logic will never reveal the truth. And we can't ever get to the truth through philosophy, through speculation and reasoning. Neither of these approaches can can reveal the truth to us. And so we can just we need not depend on them. You might have heard that once the Buddha said, to see Dhamma is to see me. If one just sees the body, the physical body that's called the Buddha, that isn't to, that isn't to really see the Buddha yet. To see the Buddha, one must see the Dhamma itself. And then in another place it says to see Bhatticha Sumupada is to see the Dhamma. So if you want to meet the Buddha to see the real Buddha, it means to see the Dhamma which is Bhatticha Sumupada. Just seeing the body or these images all over the place, it has nothing to do with seeing the true Buddha. The Buddha is seen through seeing the Dhamma of Paticca Samupada. Foolish people and, and children saw the physical body of the Buddha and thought, oh, that's, that's the Buddha. They took the, physical, the Buddha's physical body to be the real Buddha. This is rather, rather foolish. That, that body is just the skin or the outer covering, the package of the real Buddha. It's not to see just the physical body and all, it isn't to see the actual Buddha. And then people who are even more stupid than that, they think the Buddha is all these, these images. They think that a Buddha image is the real Buddha. This is a very unfortunate foolishness. The real Buddha is seen by seeing the Dhamma and that real Dhamma and the Dhamma is seen in seeing Paticca Samupada. This is the way that intelligent people see and understand the Buddha. It's not necessary to go to India or anywhere in order to find the Buddha. We only have to, to find the Buddha, we just have to go to the place where we can find Paticca Samupada. That is to go to our own heart. And in our own heart, through seeing Paticca Samupada in our own mind, we can meet the Buddha. Right now, the Buddha is, is blocked from our view by a curtain of ignorance. There's this, this curtain of ignorance hiding the Buddha from us. So if we pull aside the curtain, if we open the curtain, then we can see the Buddha right here. It's not necessary to go traveling around searching outside. Just see it here in this Paticca Samupada. This is to open the curtain. And then we find out, oh, the Buddha's sitting right here. The Buddha's been right here all along. The curtain, your, your curtain of ignorance, where is it? Have you seen it yet? Through, through studying, investigating, experimenting with Paticca Samupada, we'll, we'll see this curtain of ignorance. We'll see it clearly. And then through a thorough understanding of Paticca Samupada, we'll be able to 
pull aside the curtain. Or if we want, we can just cut it down. Cut it down and throw it away. And then in this way, we, we meet the Buddha. We can, through fully understanding, but teach us samupada, we will see the curtain of ignorance and then we'll be able to destroy it. And so we can see that merely to study this is, is quite profound. And then to practice Paticca Samupada, to actually train in this and bring it into daily life, that's very profound. It's even more profound. And then to realize the fruits of practicing Paticca Samupada, that's incredibly profound. And so anyone who would go and say, oh, it's, it's not very profound, it's or it's only somewhat profound, we'd have to say to something, such a person, don't, don't be crazy, don't go and say such a foolish thing. Now, we'd like to say something, and please don't take it to be arrogance, but we'd like to ask you, have you ever heard Paticca Samupada explained in this way? In all the books, written in Sri Lanka, Burma, Tibet, and all over the place, or including in the West, in all these books written about Paticca Samupada. Have you ever heard it explained in this way? Most of, just about every one of those books has been written following the, the interpretation of Buddha Gosa. Buddha Gosa was a Brahmin who converted to Buddhism about in the year about 500 AD. And then he wrote a very famous commentary on the Buddhist teachings called the Visuti Maga, the path of purity. The thing is, he went and interpreted the Buddhist teachings in in some interesting or unusual ways. And he explained this Paticca Samupada in a way quite different than we've explained. And then he was <coughs> doing this in Sri Lanka, and so now the Sri Lankans all, instead of following the Buddha's teaching, they follow Buddha Gosa's teaching on Paticca Samupada. And then the same has happened in Burma, in much of Thailand, and even in the Mahayana countries. So just about all the books and even the Western scholars have, who have come to study Buddhism have all followed Buddha Gosa's interpretation. Now, who's right is not for us to try and convince you, but we dare you to really look at the reality of things and see, see which version is the correct one. You don't have to believe us, but we dare you to really examine your own lives and find out which, which interpretation is the proper one, is the real one based in, in truth. Now, some of you have probably heard of the traditional Buddha Gosa version of Vatica Samupada. Or if you want, you can go out and buy some of these books, which are not very difficult to find, which explain it in this, this later interpretation, which has become the traditional one in many places. If you, if you study that interpretation of dependent origination, you'll quite quickly start to wonder how how can we apply this in our daily life? This, this, this other interpretation talks about past lives and this life and in future lives, and it teaches Samupada is dragged over many lifetimes. And so how can we practice that right here and now, today? It won't take you long till you start, if you if you approach it philosophically, you may get lost in it. But if you're interested in practicing to 
to end suffering, you'll soon start to wonder, what, what good is this? This you can, you can go and take a look for it yourself. Once we come to this point, then we, we can see that this traditional interpretation of Buddha Gosa, which talks about selves, which are from a past life, do various things, are reborn, and then through actions in this life are reborn in another life, and then this self is reborn over and over again through many lives. If we, we wonder, well, what good is this? We can see that it has, it has certain benefits as far as morality goes. All this bur belief in many lives in a series of rebirths makes people afraid of doing bad or makes people greedy for heaven. And so you can convince them to do good and not do bad. And so this can be useful for the moral, moral level of life. But if there's no way that this can be, help us to understand ultimate truth. This Paticca Samupada, which speaks about selves and egos and all that, is not ultimate truth. It's just merely a conventional truth. So if you'd like, you can, you can take a look at that. But if you want to real, find out what is ultimately true, the, the truth that can, can quench, can extinguish all dukkha, we need an interpretation of Paticca Samupada, an understanding of dependent origination that we can study and practice right now in this life. In this, in this moment. And so, we've got two main versions of the teacher's Samupada, the Buddha's version and this other one. If we, in the Buddha's time, there was just this one version of the teacher's Samupada, which completely had nothing at all to do with a self. It had nothing to do with rebirth over, over different lives. But then later, there, there came up, there were various commentators on the Buddha's teaching. And then over time, these commentators developed other things. And then this, then Buddha Gosa in the 5th century AD, I believe it's the 5th century, in his book, the Visuddhimagga, came up with this, this other version, a version that is all built up around a self. Now, if we want, we can, we can keep this interpretation. We don't have to throw it away. We can keep it and use it for the purposes of morality, for those people who can only understand on that level we can use this, this interpretation. It can be of use, but we should not confuse it with the Buddha's version. If we go back to the original scriptures, we'll find only the one, the Buddha's version. The Buddha's version that deals only with ultimate truth, that has nothing to do with selves and egos, that doesn't talk about past lives and then this life and then future lives. The Buddha's version is one of anatta, of not-self, and of ultimate truth. And that's the one that we ought to be most interested in. This other version is the version from outside the original scriptures, the tipitika, the three baskets of the original scriptures, does not include this later interpretation. So we can say we have the, the version which is of use for morality, but is merely relative truth, the truths of egos and selves, which are, are only relative and conventional ways of, of, of talking and thinking. And then there's the original version that the Buddha taught himself, 
the version that is ultimate truth. The original version of Bhatichu Samupada, the original Buddha's version that's found in the, the oldest scriptures, has the purpose of, of getting rid of self, of removing self. The, the, common, the version of the commentators, the later version, affirms that there is a self in order that it will be a good self. The one version clearly illuminates the truth of not-self, but the later version of the commentators supports the illusion of self so that that self, that belief in a self, can be developed in a good way. So we have these, these two approaches to Bhatichu Samupada, and one must know how to choose between them, to examine them and which, which is most important, which is most useful. You can look at them yourselves and choose the one that you like the most, that is most appropriate for your needs. The Bhatichu Sumupada of ultimate truth that removes the illusion of self and the Bhatichu Sumupada of relative truth which supports the illusion of, of self, of soul. If we review but teaches Samupada from the very beginning, from avicca conditioning Sankara, then Vijnana, Nama Rupa, and so on, from ignorance and then the power of concocting and then that ignorant consciousness and then mind body, then the sense media, then contact, feeling, craving, attachment, existence, birth old age, death, sorrow, lamentation, and the entire mess of dukkha. If we review the entire flow, the entire string of Bhatichu Samupada, you won't find a self anywhere in that. There's nothing in all that can be taken to be a self, a soul, an ego. This is the real Bhatichu Samupada. It, it, there's if we understand it, we see that in, in fact there's no real self, that merely it's, there's merely an illusion of self that is concocted by craving. When there's this ignorant desire, it concocts the sense of I in mind. And this, this illusion of self, this upadana, attachment, this is real. The attachment happens, but the attaching to the, the illusion of self, it's not attaching to anything real. The true Bhatichu Samupada is like this. It will clearly illuminate the truth of not-self, anatta. All the Buddha's teachings are centered in anatta. This is the heart of Buddhism. And Bhatichu, the true version, the correct version of Bhatichu Samupada, will reveal anatta quite, quite clearly. So review it all the way from the beginning to the end, that in the dependent origination of dukkha, there's no self anywhere, there's no soul. There's merely attachment, con the illusion of self concocted, out of ignorance. If we understand Bhatichu Samupada correctly, it will remove this illusion. It will get rid of this false belief in a self. This is the true version of Bhatichu Samupada which the Buddha intended to be understood. So it becomes clear that Bhatichya Samupada, understanding Bhatichya Samupada, 
gets rid of the concept of self. It gets, destroys the belief in self and therefore it gets rid of suffering. Suffering arises because of that sense of self, because of self, because of attachment to things as I and mine. But teaches Samupada will remove that attachment. Understanding Bhatichas Samupada gets rid of that attachment and so it gets rid of, of dukkha. If we understand Bhatichas Samupada according to reality, then it will remove the Upadana Khanda. The Khandas are the five aggregates of life. Body, feeling, perceptions, thought, and consciousness, vijnana. These are the five, five basic functions that make up a human being. A human being is just these five, five functions working together, interdependently. Clinging to any of these khandas is called the upadana khandas, or the aggregates that are clung to. When we cling to any of the khandas as I or mine, when we attach to them, take them personally, then there is, arises the, the concept of self. And once there is a con the concept of self, there is suffering. The Buddha summarized all suffering as, in short, the five aggregates of clinging. Clinging to the five aggregates is the essence of all dukkha. But teaches Samupada will reveal that there's, there's no, nothing to cling to. And then this concept of self, the sense of I and mine, is, is gotten rid of, and so dukkha is destroyed. The highest, most developed understanding of Dhamma in India before the Buddha's time was, was what is called the Upanishads. The word Upanishad means to, to sit near the truth, to sit close to the truth. And in these Upanishads, it's the first time that it was a very clear teaching about the self, the Atta or in Sanskrit Atman. The Upanishads teach that there is an Atman which is reincarnated many endlessly, goes through a, a, a countless series of existences. It affirmed the self in very, very clear terms. This was the highest teaching before the Buddha's time. When the Buddha was born into the world, the Buddha did not arise just to go and teach the same old thing. If somebody was just teaching the same old thing, we wouldn't call such a person the Buddha. The Buddha had to teach a higher level of truth. So the Buddha arose in the world to teach the opposite. Instead of teaching that there is a self born over and over again, the Buddha taught that there's no self, not self. The Buddha taught the, re, the, the profound truth of Paticca Samupada, that dependent on ignorance and then these, these various conditions, dukkha is concocted. And then dependent on the quenching of ignorance and the quenching of these conditions, dukkha is eliminated. Through teaching Bhaticca Samupada and Bhaticca Nirota, the Buddha clearly illuminated the fact of not-self, which we, if we want, we could say it was in order to, to clean away, to clear away the, the old scriptures, the old teachings, in order to, to bring in this, this new truth. So this is, was the, the purpose or the, the function of the Buddha to teach the reality of Paticca Samupada Bhaticca Nirota, 
that there's no self, that self is merely an illusion. Through eliminating self, dukkha is, is eliminated. We can be free of dukkha because all dukkha, all suffering, is a product of the self. Without any self, there's, there's no suffering. This was what the Buddha, the Buddha's task was. So you should be, start to understand at this point that there are two ways of speaking, two modes of language. There's the language of the ordinary person who speaks in terms of I and you, in terms of selves, in terms of people. We call this people language or personal language. This is the ordinary language that is used in the world. But there's another way of speaking. It's the way of speaking of those who understand the truth. This is a way of speaking that's based, that is based in ultimate truth. The people language is relative truth, conventional truth. But then there's this way of speaking that is talking about ultimate truth. And we call this Dhamma language. So there are these two ways of speaking or these two languages. And every word can be understood in both ways. The word birth has two meanings. The word death has two meanings. The, the words of, of being born and reborn over and over again has two meanings on the, the people level, the people language level of relative truth and the Dhamma language level of ultimate truth. We should be aware of this so that we can understand these words correctly on both levels of truth. Understanding Bhatticha Samupada will allow us to, to understand the language of Dhamma. It will allow us to speak the Dhamma language, to speak in terms of what is really true. If we don't understand Bhatticha Samupada, we'll be trapped within conventional language. And so we'll always be speaking in a way that is inherently, inherently false. The people language is based in terms which aren't really true, but they're the way that things seem to be to the common people who haven't really examined life. But those who have looked carefully at life see a deeper truth and then speak the Dhamma language, which is in the terms of that truth. But teaches Samupada, the understanding of this, will allow us to speak and understand the, the Dhamma language of, of ultimate truth. One is the language of, of untruth, of, of mere appearances, but what isn't the actual reality. And then the other language is the language of what's really happening. One is the language of selves, of souls. And then we have the language of not-self, that there's just the flow of the Kicca Samupada. For example, there's the conventional, the conventional truth of the Upanishads, of selves that are born and die through spinning around in birth and death through many, many existences, through many, many lives. In this conventional version, in this conventional relative truth, they're talking about physical birth of a body born from a mother's womb, growing and then dying, and then something going and being reborn into another physical body, and then that body dies and then born into another physical body. And this goes on and on and on in the, in the version which of relative truth, which isn't, isn't really true. Through understanding Bhatticha's Samupada, we can understand birth and death, this cycling around between birth and death in a way that is ultimately true. 
that seeing that that the Atta, the Atman, the self, is just an illusion. <clears throat> this elusive Atta is born out of ignorance, craving, attachment, and then there's the birth of, of ego, of self. And then that dies, and then every time there is dependent origination, there is birth again. This isn't a physical birth of a body. It's birth within the mind. It's spiritual birth of the elusive self, the delusion of self. And so every time there is Paticca Samupada, there is birth. And this happens over and over again, birth and death, birth and death. As long as ignorance remains, there is this spinning around in birth and death. This is the version that is correct in terms of ultimate truth. There's the, the other understanding of cycling around in birth and death in terms of physical bodies, which is relative truth. But Ticca Samupada gives us the tool to distinguish between relative truth and ultimate truth, between personal language and, and Dhamma language. And then this will, if we can understand this, then and discriminate between the two kinds of language, the two ways of speaking, then we can keep things clear. We can talk on the ordinary level when we're talking with ordinary people. But we don't get, we don't believe it because we know that way of speaking isn't really true. Because we understand the Dhamma language way of speaking. But if we don't understand Bhatiya's Samupada, we can't see the difference. And then the two ways of speaking get all mixed up and it gets very confused. And then we're trapped within the, the understanding which is fundamentally untrue. This is the great benefit of Bhatiya Samupada. It, it helps us to see that there is no real self, that it's merely an illusion concocted by, by ignorance. And this allows us to be free of dukkha. Understanding Bhatiya Samupada allows us to speak both languages and not get them mixed up. And then so we, we see the real meaning of birth and of death. And so we don't, we don't cling to the mere relative truth. And now we come to a very important word which people are always worrying about and getting quite excited and emotional about. This is the word rebirth. And there's, people are constantly asking the question, wondering whether or not there is rebirth. Is there rebirth? Is there really rebirth? People are very troubled by this question. It all depends whether we're talking in terms of people language, of, of physical rebirth, or we're talking about Dhamma language. If, we're, if people are talking in terms of some physical rebirth, if they're speaking the personal language of, of egos, and they mean some, they talk of a, a physical birth, and then that body dying, and then this soul going and being reborn in another body and this going on over and over again. If they want to teach that way, they're welcome to. That's, that's one way of talking about rebirth. If they find that useful, they're, they're welcome to it. But in Buddhism, the teaching is in Dhamma language. And so it's not of a physical rebirth, it's a spiritual rebirth that every time there is Bhatiya Samupada, there is this elusive self born, this, this delusion of ego is born, and then there is there's suffering. This, re, this happens over and over again. This, this illusion of self is born many, many times. And so it feels like a rebirth. It, it feels like the same thing, 
is being reborn over and over again. It really feels like rebirth, but it's all just an illusion. So if we ask whether there is rebirth or not, it depends. Are we speaking in terms of egos or are we speaking in terms of ultimate truth? Buddhism says, <clears throat> yes, there is rebirth. There is a spiritual rebirth within the mind every time that ignorance concocts Bhatitya Samupada. Every time there is the spin of Bhatitya Samupada, then there is an ego birth. Yes, this, this exists, but it's not, we're not talking about a physical birth about the body. It's a spiritual birth within the mind. Unfortunately, things will be quite, are quite difficult for people who now who are trying to study Buddhism because most of the books written about Buddhism completely get this, they completely mess up this matter, especially the Western, the Western scholars. They, in their books on Buddhism, they always have a chapter on karma and rebirth. But when they talk about karma and rebirth in Buddhism, they're always taking something from outside of Buddhism and attributing it to Buddhism, and so they do great disservice to the Buddha and his teachings. These chapters on karma and rebirth are always in terms of these selves, these egos that are reborn over many lifetimes, which completely goes against the heart of the Buddha's teaching. The, which is anatta, not self. That self is merely an illusion born in order to suffer and born many times within the mind. A spirit, the Buddha's teaching is about spiritual rebirth. So the question of whether or not there is rebirth depends on what way we're talking. Are we talking in physical terms or in spiritual terms? If we want to speak in if they if people want to speak in physical terms about, about rebirth through into many many different bodies over centuries and eons and whatever that, that's up to them that can have certain advantages for morality teaching people to do good and not to do bad and so they can they can do that if they want but if we want to be clear on what the Buddha's teaching is about. We should understand rebirth in the spiritual language of ultimate truth. That rebirth is just the, this concept of I, of ego, reborn in the mind. Actually, nothing is reborn even. It just feels like the same thing is reborn. Really, it's a completely new birth, but it feels like rebirth. This is how to respond to the question, is there, is there rebirth or not? If we don't get this, if we can't see the difference between these two ways of, of understanding the word rebirth, it will be impossible to understand the Buddha's teaching. And then it will be impossible to, to get free of suffering. As long as we believe in a self, it's we're condemned to suffering. So if you're wondering, am I going to be reborn? If you spent time pondering this question, am I going to be reborn? It all depends what kind of rebirth you're wondering about. The physical rebirth of people language or the spiritual rebirth of Dhamma language. If we're talking in terms of Dhamma language, <coughs> you can just look, look inside, and you can see Bhatitya Samupada as it arises. You see this arising of dependent origination. And then you see, yes, I've got rebirth. There's rebirth here for me. Because you can see it right here if you're within, within the mind. And so you know for yourself that whether there is rebirth or not. 
if, if, if there's rebirth for you or not. As for the other kind of rebirth, the physical kind of rebirth, you, you've got no, there's no way you can see it. How can you look and see whether you're going to be reborn or not? There's no way you can see it. There's, it's impossible to know and understand rebirth. All you can do is believe what somebody else tells you. It's written down in some book or some, some preacher says that you're going to be reborn and this and this and this. The most you can do is believe someone else, take it on someone else's authority. And then you've got no, it's not your own truth, it's just some second-hand truth you picked up from somebody else. You've got no, you've got no freedom if all you do, all we do is believe other people. But this spiritual rebirth in the mind we can see right here. Every time there is Baticca Samupada, the, the delusive self, this, this ego, this belief, the belief in ego is reborn. And you can see it happening. And so you know for yourself whether there is rebirth for you or not. You don't have to depend on anyone else or believe anyone else. This physical rebirth, we have no way of knowing. It's, it's not really, it can't really be true. It's got no ultimate, ultimate truth the way this spiritual rebirth has. You can see right for yourself the ultimate truth of it. This other stuff, although it's not ultimately true, we can still, we, <clears throat> because it's not ultimately true, we ought to leave it alone. We shouldn't get caught up in it. However, we, we can still kind of have it around. We don't have to get rid of it completely. We can have it around for the sake of children or people who don't have much wisdom, who need such kind of teachings for the sake of morality. People who aren't very bright need rather simple arguments to convince them to do good and not do bad. So we can have this, this rebirth in terms of selves, as a way to explain to people who aren't so bright why they need morality. But for people with more wisdom, that becomes unnecessary. Seeing, seeing Bhaticcha Samupada is enough, and one knows the need for morality without having to believe anyone else or take it on someone else's authority. So whether we'll be reborn or not, it depends on whether we're talking about physical rebirth or spiritual rebirth. And also, we should see that that physical rebirth, it's, it's not a problem. There's no need in worrying about physical rebirth. Dukkha does not arise because of physical birth. There's no problem with being born physically. There's nothing wrong with it, there's no problem. The problem is with spiritual rebirth. Every time there is Baticca Samupada, this delusive ego is born, and that's how suffering happens. Suffering happens because of the, the ego concept, the, the belief in self. So the problem is with spiritual rebirth. So we can leave alone that physical rebirth. It's the spiritual rebirth that we need to concern ourselves with, and we can see it right for ourselves. And it's this kind of spiritual rebirth that we should avoid. Don't be reborn spiritually. As far as the physical rebirth, we've no way of knowing whether it's true or not, so there's no need to worry about it. But this spiritual rebirth is crucial whether we're going to, to live with, so, with suffering or live free of suffering. It all depends on understanding rebirth in spiritual terms. And so now we've got this spiritual rebirth. We can see right here 
this rebirth as it happens. It's santitiko, to be directly realized by oneself, within oneself. See it clearly, directly, right here, by oneself. This rebirth, we can see directly, every time there is paticca samupada, there is rebirth. The illusion of ego is reborn. This happens many, many times in one day, so you have plenty of opportunities to observe it. Some people, in fact, are really good. It can happen every second. They see something and there's rebirth. A sound hits the air, there's another rebirth. A smell comes in the nose, another rebirth. A taste on the tongue, another rebirth. Some people, they're really good at this. There's rebirth every second. This is the rebirth that we can know for ourselves, experience for ourselves, see for ourselves. This is the rebirth that is true in ultimate terms, and we can observe it. Through understanding, but teaches Samupada will understand rebirth. And when we see that rebirth of the illusion of ego is the basis of suffering, then we find the way out from suffering. Through understanding this rebirth, this spiritual rebirth, we can realize Nibbana, realize the perfect coolness and perfect peace where life is, life continues in a very natural way, but there's no more, no more suffering, no more defilement. So time has come to an end and we'll have to end today's talk now. So you ought to agree by now with the Buddha that Paticca Samupada is something very, very profound, <laughs> incredibly deep, because you've had to sit through all this explanation and go through all this difficulty in order to, to understand it. Thank you for being very patient listeners. <laughs>